and I'll just be doing a short um, lecture on ecosystem service valuation and then uh, I'll do a short lecture on how to craft surveys because oftentimes that's actually how you do ecosystem service valuation. So remember, you know, the first day we um, we defined ecosystem services and we talked about different e kinds of ecosystem services and we said it'd be really nice to find ways to measure the level of ecosystem service or for some baseline or change over time and you've seen some tools throughout the class on how to do that but there's one commonly used tool although highly attacked tool um, that is basically putting a value i.e. you know a dollar amount a monetary amount on um, what these ecosystem services, what, what these services provide to us. And there are market and non-market valuation techniques. Um, I won't be talking very much about the market valuation um, because those are more, um, um, those are much more accepted. Uh, and, but I'll give you lots of examples of non-market um, valuation techniques. Uh, so, within this uh, valuation approach, um, there are obviously marketed and non-marketed goods. So, um, so the marketed goods are those for which you have a market, i.e. you have someone that's willing to buy um, for a set price um, <coughs> what you're selling and thus you can more straightforwardly assign a dollar value to it. Um, and oftentimes, market things that have a market and that are located on the site where you're evaluating, you know, the where the services might be, they will be included in an economic analysis because it's really easy to make the correspondence. Oh, it's here, and people are buying it, um, so I'm going to include it in my um, valuation of these ecosystem services. Even things that have a market, so maybe you know fish or shellfish, um, but that that are offsite, i.e., um, so and I forgot to say this is an example from a mangrove forest. Um, so things that um, the mangrove forest provided a nursery for these fish um, when they were young, and then the fish dispersed beyond, obviously, the mangrove. Um, and so the fish, there's a, there's a clear market for fish, um, but they might not be included in the, value, the, in the valuation of this mangrove forest because it's not co-located. It's, it's somewhere beyond the mangrove, and so it's, it's, easily, it's easily forgotten, but not always. The non-marketed goods, um, e even if they're on-site, or, or especially if they're off-site, um, can oftentimes be um, neglected to be included in the valuation exercise. So uh, here, the example of on-site, non-marketed goods coming from this mangrove forest would include medicinal use of the trees, I guess, um, food in times of famine, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, which oftentimes they'll be forgetted. And then um, mangroves, as you all know, um, they'll provide a storm buffer um, to villages that are far behind, um, beyond the mangrove. Um, they'll also um, mitigate nutrient flows, or, or, um, and those are typically ignored when you do a marketing, um, when you do a valuation exercise. So this is just a precursor. You've got examples of what valuation would look like. Um, the first person to really do this, well, group to really do this on a global scale was Dr. Costanza, and they published their results in Nature in 1997. And they even had a map, which was pretty cool, of the you know U.S. dollars per hectare per year that every location um, on Earth would provide. Um, well, most. And uh, people went totally nuts when this came out, um, to, to put it mildly, uh, because basically, and he had a big error bar, but basically the total amount of um, 
serve of value from these services we were dri deriving from nature was equivalent or three times with the error bar that of the global economy. And people said, how is that possible? Like that just can't be. Your numbers are wrong and and etc. And he got his group got really attacked for it. But if you think about, you know, if you think about sustainability and, and where our resources come from, the fact that you know, you can derive more value than we account for in traditional economics from nature, to me, is a no-brainer. Um, but I think at the time it was um, slightly revo revolutionary. So the methods have changed from then, and as you'll see, they have, mul uh, on how to do this, have multiplied um, to the detriment of this um, field. But, um, but they are, they can be rather approachable. Um, so here's, um, the, the, so here's a way to kind of classify the methods. So you have some where you have revealed preferences, some where you're using costs from something else to, um, to um, uh, give a value to your, the ecosystem service or services you're trying to look at. And then you have stated preference methods. Um, these are all um, accepted in the literature as possible methods. We're not going to go over all of these. We're just going to go. Oops. We're just going to go over the ones and br very briefly the ones that are uh, have the orange circles. But if you're interested in some of the others. Um, we can talk about them later, although some of them I don't actually know how they, um, they work. Um, there's just too many, really. The market price, this should be um, not new to you, um, but it's basically on the market, what does it cost to buy or to sell the particular good or product that is coming from um, that ecosystem? Um, so here's an example. Um, where you know th they know that from this particular tract, uh, this conservation area, there's a certain value assigned to um, the meat that is coming from there. So bush meat um, coming from the plants in the area, as well as um, fuel for cooking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they can put a dollar value on there. The travel costs, um, yeah, and actually. So everyone in the little exercise, you're going to be assigned one of these um, to come up with an example of how you would apply this method to value trees in a city. So um, it would, I think I'm going to do the groups now so that you make sure that at least for your ecosystem, for your um, valuation approach, you've written down how you might do that. And so we're going to do it in groups of two. And I think I have, I wrote it down. I can't remember how many groups I need. But I wrote it down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven groups. So uh, travel costs, um, the way you use this one is you um, gather data on how much people have spent, i.e. are willing to spend to use or to benefit from those particular ecosystem services for recreational purposes. So um, obviously, you know, that one, um, it's one of the drawbacks is that it's only used for recreational services, really. Um, and that it's highly, it's data hungry, right? You have to go and ask for the restaurateurs and the hotel, um, pe the, the hotelier, the, the people who run hotels in the area. Um, how much are people spending and for what reason? And sometimes it's more straightforward, you know, how much are people, you can do a survey at the entrance of a park and ask people, you know, how far did you travel? Because it's not just, it's just, not just um, money, it's also time, but how far you travel will, you know, how much did gas cost, um, how much is the entrance fee to the park, and all of that would get, get you an estimate of how willing people are to, um, to pay 
for this ecosystem service. Um, so it's sometimes called the people's implied willingness <laughs> to pay. Um, and people have done this, um, you know, in the U.S. for uh, how much um, Americans are paying to do freshwater uh, sports, fishing, boating on freshwater lakes in the U.S. and it was 37 billion per year, something like that. The replacement costs are the costs of replacing the environmental good or uh, service. So you have to find um, other, you have to find, usually it's mechanical or industrial ways to conduct whatever that ecosystem service was doing. So maybe it's water purification um, facilities, you know, a, a water treatment plant, things like that. How much do they cost to do the same thing that the natural um, ecosystem service would do for free? Um, and so you get a, an estimate of the money you save by protecting that environment rather than building the you know, water treatment plant or whatever it is that you needed to build. Um, the replacement cost is used oftentimes, um, so highly useful. It's fairly simple to apply um, as long as right, you find a perfect replacement. And so in the example I gave you, the water treatment plant is a pretty good replacement to water purification services, but it ignores all the other services that that, that natural patch of land or that, you know, um, that, that area was, was going to provide. So it's usually kind of a rough indicator um, and it, it is known to undervalue the ecosystem services because it doesn't take into account all of the services. You're just not going to find, you know, there's, um, there's, not gonna, there's no way to account for the beauty of the landscape or anything like that, obviously. Um, yeah, so here um, they, they had an example in Cambodia in this national park where that, that tract of land was helping with storm protection and silt trapping, uh, both of which are things, you know, that we can build, build um, barriers for and build systems to do, and we know how much that's going to cost. And so then you, you say, oh, well, that's the value of the, that ecosystem service. <laughs> the contingent valuation, and let me find my notes. The contingent valuation is often referred to as um, the people's stated willingness to pay. So we'll, you'll see in the literature WTP, that's willingness to pay, and this is how, what people state they are willing to pay for one or more ecosystem services, um, often done through surveys. So you basically, I mean, all, all it is is you're asking people, you know, what would you pay, if we were to build a, uh, to protect this land, what would you pay to allow this? Or, um, and, and I'll give you, well, actually you'll come up with other examples later. Um, it's really flexible. You can use this one to, to on almost any ecosystem service, so that's nice. But you have to be careful. The person has to understand the ecosystem service. Um, so they have to understand that, um, you know, the, the forest um, reduces runoff uh, and things like that. Otherwise, they, they're not going to be willing to pay for it and you're dramatically going to underestimate your value. Um, it's one of the most used methods. And it's been widely used, so you, it's nice because you can compare your estimates to what's in the, in the literature. Uh, but it is controversial, and there's a lot of research on how to set up that particular survey for contingent valuation and how not to, i.e. there's, you know, psycho, uh, there's almost psychologists looking at this and thinking, um, how could we... Uh, how can we set up these surveys so we get the answer we want? Um, but, yeah. 
The other three methods um, we're going to briefly talk about are hedonic pricing, benefit transfer analysis, and the choice um, experiments. A hedonic pricing, another name for it, is the revealed preference method. So in this one, you're, um, a good example would be comparing the sale price of similar homes um, and you've got one set of homes that are overlooking a healthy marsh or a, you know a healthy mangrove or a healthy beach and you have another set of homes that don't have um, the, that don't have that view or don't have that access and you look at the price differential between the two groups and you can control for other, it's usually done through a regression, and you can control for, you know, square footage of house, lot size, number of bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And so then you get a value of how much more people are willing to pay, but in actually actuality, right, you're no longer asking them, these are sale prices that have been recorded, how much more are people willing to pay for um, that particular suite of ecosystem services that that marsh is providing or that beach is providing. You can also do it with wages. So if, um, if people have the same jobs but one job is nearby a set of a park or something where you know people are encouraged to go run around and then one is in the middle of a dense city and there's nothing around, no parks, you can use the wage differential like how much um, lower are people um, willing to accept you know, basically a pay cut um, in order to have access to those ecosystem services, especially recreational services nearby. Um, the, the, the positive is that you can really control for other, as long as you have the data, you can control for other variables that might influence that cost or that wage. Um, but the negative is you need all those data and um, they're not always readily available. Um, so that's the um, you know, definition really, the approach. So difference in property or wage prices that can be ascribed to the existence or level of nearby environmental goods and services. Oftentimes a statistical approach. The benefit transfer analysis is interesting. Um, Basically, you're adapting es estimates of ecosystem service value developed in some other area and you're adapting them to your area. You're transferring that knowledge that someone did somewhere else and you're, you're, um, you're assigning it to your area. So it works well if somebody's done um, a similar study um, you know, but it has to be like the, the, the con is how similar is similar enough and can these values really be transferred to my population or my area? You know, so if it was the U.S., there's sport fisheries. People will pay to go fish in the Gulf of Mexico. They also pay to go fish off the Pacific coast. But it's really different kinds of fishermen. Can we use their values and and um, and and um, and say that they're equivalent to um, the Gulf Coast fisher, the Gulf Coast fish um, tourism industry? Like that's where it gets a little bit murky. I like to think of this as basically this should be your literature review. If you're ever doing this kind of analysis, you should look at what other people have valued your particular um, natural environment as in the literature. See how much the um, you know what's the min, what's the max, what's the mean, um, and then and then use that to guess what it would be in your location. You know, an informed guess of what it would be in your location, and then from there um, develop your own methodology and, and use one of these other methodologies. But some people stop there; they just use that literature, apply it, and they're done. And the last one we'll talk about are the choice experiments. I think they're really cool. Uh, you're basically presenting to someone, so this is in a focus group or in an interview setting or a survey, you're presenting a series of alternative resources or use options. 
And so um, a good example would be, uh, so it's, it's similar homes, you know, it's, it's like a realist, well, like, yeah, like, a, or maybe a vacation, um, vacation pamph, no, let's do home. So it's, it's like a real estate pamphlet that gives you the house and it gives you the specs of the house, how many square feet, how many bedrooms, um, but it also has some sort of, maybe there's a stream going through this property and then a very similar property but no stream and there's a price and you ask people which of these two houses would you pick and you do this a lot, you have to do this you have to gather massive amounts of data with lots of permutations of the house type and etc. But eventually you might, you hope to see that the um, parcels, the properties that have the stream that runs through it or that have more trees for example or more mature trees would sell for more. And so that price difference again is used as a way to value the ecosystem services that are provided there.